Today's episode of Beyond the Mask is presented by the team at CRNA Financial Planning. Get a free consultation today to be guided through the complexities of investing and financial planning. Just visit crnafinancialplanning.com. Beyond the Mask is also sponsored by crnaeducation.com. CRNAs, you can get the CE credits you need by just going to crnaeducation.com. They have over 100 AANA prior approved credits, all four core CPC modules, and even over 40 pharmacology credits. No subscriptions, it's all online and mobile friendly. Just go to crnaeducation.com. And don't forget, listening to our podcast can earn you Class B credits. For more information on how you can submit them, check out our CE Credit tab on our website, beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Welcome to Beyond the Mask, innovation and opportunities for CRNAs and advanced practice nurses with certified financial planner Jeremy Stanley and CRNA Sharon Pierce. Jeremy Stanley has worked with CRNAs for more than 23 years, and Sharon Pierce is a former president of the AANA and the NCANA. Join us as we leave the operating room and learn the latest in the CRNA and advanced practice nurse industries. Beyond the Mask starts in 10, 9, 8, 7. Hey Sharon, it's been a minute. I know, I've missed you. I know, right? Uh, we haven't recorded in a little while, so uh, let's see if we can knock the dust off and, and do a good job today. Tell me your name again, just one more time. <laughs> I'll tell you later about that. Uh, I'll just call you what I want to call you. You do anyway. What are you talking I do. about? So, you know, um, I've been called many names by you, so... <laughs> And get a glass of wine in you and you call me all kinds of things. That's so. it. All with love. All with love. <laughs> well, we've got a, another great show put together today. And uh, Sharon, why don't you introduce it? Oh, I would love to do that. Today, we're delving in the heart of all matters concerning the American Association of Nurse Anesthetists, AANA, one of my first loves, as we both know. We're privileged to be joined by two prominent guests. So we've got Drew Riddle, the current president of the AANA, and Bill Bruce, the chief executive officer of the AANA. Drew brings a wealth of experience with his career spanning years of service in the field of nurse anesthesia, education, the Cochrane reports, the list goes on. I don't have enough time for it. And Bill, the new CEO, well, not so new anymore, <laughs> whose strategic vision and leadership have pushed the AANA forward. You guys, thank you for joining us. Look forward to talking about all things AANA as we explore key issues, new things, and initiatives going on within the organization. Jeremy, with that, why don't you ask the first question? You want me to ask the first question? Okay. <laughs> well, well, first, Sharon, I just want to correct you. You know how I love to do that. So you said American Association of Nurse Anesthetists. Oh, Jesus. Don't start. Let's get it right. Okay. Let's just Mike McKinnon right. and and Joe, I did that just to ruffle your feather. <laughs> I, I know somebody's going to say something about it, so I wanted to bring it out. So nurse anesthesiology, okay? Let's get it right. Uh, so. Listen, old habits die hard. That's why you're still around. Oh, uh, there you go. But I hadn't been around quite as long as you. But anyway, I'll digress. Um, so Drew, why don't we just start talking about you know the workforce, where we are, and what you're seeing out there right now? Yeah, a uh, great question. And uh, Sharon and Jeremy, thanks. It's um, I think this is one of multiple uh, opportunities I've had to sit down with the two of you. It's always a, a pleasure to be invited and to um, get a little bit of, of, of time with both of you. So it's no secret. I don't know. I was actually in the operating room all day today. And um, it's no secret as we show up to our clinical practices, um, whether you're in a ambulatory surgery center and the the big downtown, you know, mega facility that we are short of anesthesia providers, both CRNAs and physician anesthesiologists, various markets, of course, looking a little better and a little worse than others. It's interesting that uh, the workforce is where we are. 
and all of the sort of conflating factors around what we are talking about, at least at the board level, around the why behind this. And there's a lot of finger pointing going on on, well, is, you know, is it price? Are we pricing ourselves out of the market? Or is this all related to reimbursement? Or is this related to supply uh, supply chain issues, if we want to think of us as cogs on a conveyor belt? And I, I think we probably all would say it's a little bit of everything. However, I think we're going to see if the predictions that I'm seeing and looking at some of the trends across the U.S. and some of the modelings are correct, um, we may be closer to the end of that severe shortage than perhaps we once were. You know, we look at the production on the production side a little bit. Are we producing enough CRNA graduates annually? And th those trends, those numbers continue to, to eke up. And I'm proud of our uh, educational programs, those um, programs that have uh, worked their way through converting to the doctoral degree now for entry into practice. It was a big hurdle and we're there, y'all. It's really exciting. And we saw a little dip, as we know, as programs converted. And we're on the other side of that dip a little bit. We've also seen some plateauing in the retirement uh, rate. You know, COVID and Jeremy, I know you can speak to this with a lot of your clients, you know, really accelerated folks that threw up in their hands and are like, yo, I am out. Yeah. This, I, I may be a couple years early, but let's figure out how to make it happen so I never have to go back in the hospital again. I think we're seeing that. We're also seeing, I think, some early signs if we look at the claims data that you know, the economy, while good, we are seeing some folks losing their jobs, maybe at an uptick rate, even though overall unemployment is still really solid, uh, certain sectors in particular. So we may be seeing a little decline, intermittent decline right now in services. All of that to say, I think we are on a trajectory to be balanced in the next three or so years where we have a supply demand that is it, it, not in every market, you know, so this isn't going to fix, it's not the panacea, but I think we're, I think we're getting closer to our target. You know, for those of us that have been working clinically, um, and, and I only practice one day a week right now, but I'll tell you those days are, are tough because it is not the level of staffing like we would have seen perhaps in the past. So maybe there's a little bit of breathing room there. Well, Jeremy, this is something that you love. You talk about this all the time. It is. You know, and it, it is interesting, you know, Drew, I think you you hit part of the nail on the head there talking about people retiring and so forth. And I'll, you know, some of the slowdown that I think we see now is that, man, the money is just so good. People are just sticking around to make the money um, in this environment as well. So, you know, that slowed some of the attrition, I think, of of retirement as well. But Bill, you want to add anything to that? No, no, I just I, I think Drew did a did a great job of summarizing that. And um, you know, we're one thing that that's interesting to me in this is we're looking at the you know the, the wave of the future wave of retirement that 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 is gonna come. And uh, our members are a little bit younger than than members than a lot of other health care organizations. So we what we can do is we can look to how other organizations are dealing with with the wave of retirements who you know, well, my last organization, for instance, the, the the median age of our members was 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 well into the sixties, and so it was it's it was at the doorstep. Um, whereas here, we've got a little bit more of a runway to to see the effect it's going to have on the organization, but also, you know, to see kind of what happens when we get to that balance point in the workforce, and 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 you know, how is that going to going to adjust the things that we need to be doing as an organization. And, um, you know, I think we still have a little bit of time to figure it out and, and, and anticipate it. But yeah, it's definitely, it's good that it's on our radar. Well, speaking of what we can do as an organization, I know that there's been a lot of talk and movement, even at the state levels, about the pipeline from the RN, uh, from our pool. And I know at some of our state meetings in North Carolina, we've got RNs who are coming to the meetings now because they want to be a CRNA and what a great way to bring those into the fold. So Drew, what are we doing as an organization to kind of cater to that? Because we know the other side is catering to them to draw them into the AA programs. 
it's interesting. You and I were around long enough to remember when we were the best kept secret, right? And now we don't want to be the best kept secret. In fact, we want to be front and center in front of everyone. And this notion that we just need to sort of sit back and all of the RNs that are critical care nurses are going to flock to nurse anesthesia without any effort on our part is, I think, quite frankly, a, a very um, myopic view of of what we need to be doing. I, I would assert and I would indict myself in this that I've not done a good job in my career, except on the one off occasional time where I've identified a great ICU nurse with whom I've practiced of really going out and sharing with our undergraduate nursing students and and y'all maybe even before that our high school students about what nursing as a career and then the subset of nurse and of, of advanced practice nursing as a career and then go a little deeper specifically nurse anesthesia as a as a career choice as a viable career choice and that there are particular ways you can tee yourself up as a professional to be a highly sought after candidate to become ultimately in our case of course we'd like them to become crnas the AANA um, membership passed a bylaw that allows for a new category of member, as as everyone knows. And if you don't know, I'm I guess I'll be the first to share it with you if you hadn't hadn't heard before. And that is the opportunity to invite registered nurses and other APRNs to become members of the AANA. Now, I'll let Bill kind of explain how that logistically is looking to happen, but it is well underway that we can offer a membership opportunity for individuals that have an interest in anesthesia. I think, and the board has talked about this category of membership, likely being a somewhat high churn membership category, meaning these may be individuals who are in their two or three or four years of critical care experience, know they want to become a CRNA, want to engage with our professional association and engage with our members as a member themselves to get access to opportunities to um, for mentorship or, or um, resources, et cetera. And then they become from a registered nurse member to a associate member as a uh, learner in a CRNA program and ultimately to a certified and then recertified member. So I think there's a little bit of a stepping stone trajectory there. But, you know, I, I, I say this all the time to registered nurses with whom I have an opportunity to speak about our profession. And every one of them tells me, I wish there were a way I could become more permanently engaged with the AANA. And Sharon, your point is so well taken seeing them at the meetings. I was at a state meeting just this last weekend and 15 or 20 percent of the audience were registered nurses, not enrolled in a CRNA program, but were registered nurses in the community interested in nurse anesthesia. And so the AANA, I think, is in a is positioning itself well through the strategic vision of the board to say, hey, we need to really embrace these folks, bring them in, grow them, mentor them and and help hopefully in enculturate. It sounds like we're putting them in a cult. That's not what I mean here. But <laughs> but really, how great would it have been? I know for me, I didn't go to a single state meeting before I went to CRNA school. How great would it be that that when someone graduates as a brand new CRNA, they have already been a member of the AANA for six, seven years at that point and understand who we are and the value we bring. I think our member retention goes up. I, there's lots of, we can talk about this for hours. I'll be quiet because I'm sure Bill wants to clarify some things around what this membership <laughs> category looks like. Well, to know us is to love us, right? So that's true. Very welcome yeah. as, a, as a group. They're less likely to get away if we can get a hold of them, right? <laughs> they, they are. I'll, I'll just add, you know, similar to Drew's experience, I was... Um, recently at, at the Ohio meeting where, to my knowledge, the first time that we really had a conversation about you know, the makeup of who is in the room. We've always known that our, our students and residents come to our state meetings in, in, in high numbers, just like they do our national meetings. It's That is remarkable on its own. But we discovered that the RNs that were in the room were, were similar, were just, it was a surprising number. I think we, we had several dozen in the room in, in, in Ohio, and it was, um, it was way more than I think anybody had really expected to be there. 
So that we are paying attention to this from a pipeline standpoint, I think is really exciting and it presents some, some real opportunities. That will also begin to play into one of the other things that that we talk about a lot is what do we do for the people in the zero to five years? And we, you know, we're, we're specifically looking at that as a separate issue, but it is connected to this pipeline issue. And I think the more we, we pay attention to RNs who are looking to become CRNAs, the more um, better equipped we're going to be at, at knowing what kinds of solutions and, and services we need to provide to people earlier in their career. And hopefully that will improve that particular segment of our membership and their retention as, as it moves forward. This was a bylaw amendment that, that passed at last year's Congress and um, goes it goes into effect formally in the, at the beginning of the upcoming fiscal year. For reasons we, we won't go into here, there, there, it, it is actually a difficult process inside the organization because of our technology stack to create new member categories. And so there's a tremendous amount of work that has gone into preparing us for that. But but all of that is on track. We'll be able to accept new members at the beginning of the next fiscal year in this category. And I, you know, I think that it presents us with um, an additional challenge and that once we have people who are in this category who are not yet are in CRNA school, but are members of the organization, they're of course going to be interested in the things that we already have available to our current members. But any new group of members is going to be looking for something that is really kind of specific and aimed at them. And so we need to begin thinking about what kinds of things we need to have on the table that is that is developed and aimed specifically at our ends who are on this trajectory and help them on that path so that they understand the value of membership in an organization like the AANA. So I, I, it's an exciting journey and it, it dovetails into a number of the other things that we were already doing and it reinforces some of the ideas we have for how we're going to be a strong organization well into the future. It's, it's just really exciting. I can't wait to see how much um, how much response we get to this new category. We've had the mentorship program where CRNAs mentored SRNAs. How cool would it be if SRNAs mentored the RNs? How this process is. Sharon, it's so funny. We must be on the same brain link because I was getting ready to say the exact same thing. And that's kind of <laughs> scary right there. And then just to throw in there, what about the RNs mentoring those folks in, in high school who are trying to make mm -hmm. at least explore a bit. I think I want to do something in healthcare, but I don't really know what's out there other than, you know, I go to my pediatrician so I could be a doctor physician. Uh, I go to my dentist. Maybe I could be a dentist. Sometimes I go to Walgreens and pick up a prescription. What do those people do? But, you know, there's not a lot of um, specific outreach there to, to even mentor mentor beyond be, before rather nursing school so i think there's a there's a pipeline that gets created in that trajectory builds commitment to our profession and sharon you've talked about this and i've heard you say this over the years commitment to our profession beyond the excellent anesthesia care we provide but commitment to our patients in a way that we advocate for ourselves so we can best care for our patients and building that early is great yeah, and I'll, and I'll tell you, as a non-CRNA that goes to meetings, a lot of meetings I've been to, man, you guys are a fun group. So if we get them around you guys, hey, they're they're bound to go back to anesthesia school and be CRNAs, that's for sure. Well, I mean, that's a that's a wonderful initiative. And, you know, again, thinking outside of the box, I mean, I, I'm, I'm seeing this reoccurring from the ANA, the ANA board. Are there any other workforce development initiatives out there that you guys are looking at that might be on the horizon right now? Aside from really ensuring we make sure we're tapping into the category of individuals or the group of individuals that because of accreditation reasons are our only audience for CRNAs. And that is um, registered nurses at this point, registered nurses in critical care, you know, intensive care kinds of units and doing that well. We, you know, Jeremy, we've talked at the board level and you know how board meetings are. A bunch of people get together that are really, really um, excited about something. And there's a million things that get thrown at the wall and you see kind of spaghetti what sticks, right? But the board has has made a, I think, a, a, a reasonably strong statement that we want to do this part of it really, really well on the workforce 
perspective to ensure that we are allowing this opportunity for membership to be meaningful and useful to someone and not just, we, we don't want this to be something that pads someone's resume to get them into school. It, it, that that makes no sense. It's a it it doesn't it doesn't add any value to our organization to have people that feel like, well, I just became a member because it looked better when I applied to X Y Z University. Um, so we're going to do that well before we start thinking, you know, way way beyond that. Although there's some other things kind of percolating in the background for for sure. Hey CRNAs, it's time to simplify your continuing education. Welcome to CRNAeducation.com, your trusted provider for CPC core modules and a plethora of Class A CE credits. You can explore 43 detailed articles covering various anesthesia topics, all from your favorite device, anytime, anywhere. And with over 40 pharmacology CE credits, meet your state board requirements effortlessly. Whether you need a few credits or everything to recertify, we have what you need. Just complete your credits online without any subscriptions or recurring charges. You can trust in our 100% CRNA-owned platform, established in 2011, ensuring you receive the best in customer service and educational content. Ready to learn? Go to crnaeducation.com, making continuing education easy and accessible. And don't forget that support is always a quick email or a text or phone call away. To sign up and learn more, just go to crnaeducation.com. You know, let's kind of change topics here for just a minute. And, um, you know, I'm not sure which one of you want to take this one, but uh, something, Drew, I've heard you speak about before, and that's the reimbursement issue. You want to kind of touch on that a little bit and what's going on in that realm? This has been whack-a-mole for as long as I've been involved in this organization. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's two, to me, there's sort of two parallel problem, not problem. Yeah, problems. Let's call them what they are. <laughs> problems around reimbursement right now. The first, and this has been a 12-year endeavor where the Affordable Care Act was passed, and yet opportunities for rulemaking to occur although they have existed, has not been finalized. And so we can't, we cannot rely on the federal government to enforce the law because there are no rules underpinning that enforcement. And that is related to provider non-discrimination. So for everybody listening, and if you don't know what that means, it makes it a fed, it makes it federally illegal to discriminate based on a particular provider's type of licensure. So uh, an example I give all the time related to this is, you know, a CRNA does a general anesthetic, a physician anesthesiologist does a general anesthetic, the standard of care is the same, the outcome is the same, yet the reimbursement for those same services is um, is not equitable. And um, it's a great opportunity now to bring that to light. And, and I can say that we are having some incredibly high level um, in, in really big homes in Washington, D.C., where important people that are elected uh, live in those kinds of places uh, as we speak. And within the next couple of weeks, some of us on this call will be in said home having conversations with said people. The other piece is related to what is blatant discrimination by Cigna. And I'm calling them out because we have reached out to Cigna from the association and we have yet to hear a response. Cigna, we need to know why you are discriminating against nurse anesthetists when we independently deliver anesthesia to your insured uh, individuals. For those that don't know, in March of this year, I'm sorry, March of last year, Cigna put out a uh, 15% pay cut for anesthesia services delivered by a CRNA that are non-medically directed. So QZ billing for those of you that are in the billing world. And um, we are in the process of, um, of uh, await- awaiting that response. And so um, there's, there's opportunities for, you know, when one does, so do others potentially, right? So I think we need to be very aware of what's happening. The AANA, I will assure your listeners is intimately aware of what's happening and has a a, a very um, clear and uh, concise forward path that I am not at liberty to share beyond what that what the fact that we're going to be doing something uh, about it. Bill, did I did I break any rules there? You did not. You said exactly as much as could be said. Goodness. 
Goodness, uh, this is this is a never oh. ending story. And I know whenever I was dealing with it as president, I would say you are paying for the degree of the provider and not the degree of the care. So mm-hmm. that's a that's a problem. And it's a problem. And I want to, if I may, just for a moment, this sounds very self-serving. Poor, poor Drew. He's just not getting paid enough money to do what he has. He makes enough money. Can he make a little bit less? This is not about provider pay. This is about the ability for patients to access critically important life-saving anesthesia services. Because there is a cost to providing our care. There's a cost to providing our uh, our business, just like any business. There's a cost to providing business. And all of us are in this business because we put patients first. That's why I show up every day. That's why all of us show up every day. We put patients first. But if it becomes an insolvent opportunity for me to conduct business because the cost of conducting the business outweighs or out, uh, you know, the scales are tipped in the wrong direction. And I can't provide care without actually costing myself money to do so results in my inability to continue to provide that care. And so then what happens? It costs X number of dollars to have an anesthesia department staffed by whomever, fill in the blank. And if the reimbursement from the individuals like the patients themselves directly, United Healthcare, Cigna, Blue Cross, Blue Shield, the third party payers, Medicare, Medicaid services, CMS, uh, TRICARE, you go down the litany of lists, does not equate to what it costs to provide that care, then that burden of cost is shifted somewhere. And it's typically shifted to the hospital or the healthcare system or the ambulatory surgery center. And it becomes an unsustainable model where it is costing far more to provide the care ultimately than the care is uh, generating in in terms of, of a revenue stream. And we see it, y'all. I I mean, I know in North Carolina it's happened. It certainly happened. I'm in Texas, and we've got a lot of rural places in Texas where little small hospitals that may be the closest for Mima and Papa to get to are closing their doors because they're insolvent. And instead of a 20-minute drive, it's a a two-and-a-half-hour drive. Or Mima and Papa just don't get the care they need, and they end up suffering, God forbid, maybe even dying. And it really is... This can be a life and death situation uh, in 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 terms of critical anesthesia services, life saving services. So I don't mean to sound sort of um, uh, melodramatic about it, but it's not just about the money; it's really about the patients. Yes. So, Bill, have I know it's probably working the office to death there. How how is it uh, for you guys in the office? You know, we, we, we put a tremendous amount of, of effort into fighting for all of our issues in D.C. every day. And, and you know, we, we have some changes in the, in the team in D.C. over the past year and a half. Uh, new chief advocacy officer, Ingrid Alesis, who who comes to us from, from another organization. We've introduced her before, and I, I, a good many of our members have had the chance to meet her and, and, and I think been impressed with her. But you know, one one thing that 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 I got to participate in with with this new new team that we have is uh, Drew and I were both were both there back in in December. We were traveling to D.C. for a an, what we we thought to be a very important meeting on another advocacy adjacent issue that that wound up not happening. It gave us an opportunity to meet with a great number of people on the Hill. And I think, I don't remember the final count here. I think it was 62 or 63 members of Congress wow. that that our staff was able to organize, you know, face-to-face meetings with some in person, some um, on the Hill, some in different office meeting, meetings where we were able to present our case for what, what policy agendas we have and share some ideas with them. And it, it really is is incredible. Our, our team in D.C., is one of the most impressive advocacy teams that I've ever had the privilege of working with. If you have the opportunity, and we're we're coming up on mid-year, so we're going to have Hill meetings, and I would encourage people who are, uh, well, who will have been by the time this gets aired, you know, I hope that people who who listen to this had an opportunity to 
to go on some hill visits, visits and see how our staff um, are able to foster those communications and make those connections. You know, we walk around the Capitol when we have meetings and staffers from both sides of the aisle, from pretty much every state that you can imagine, every district that you can imagine, recognize our staff, are friendly and delighted to see them. How are you doing? It's wonderful the level of access that we've been able to gain and begin to leverage. And it, it, I think it's 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 been incredible. They do put in a tremendous amount of hours to, to make that happen and are incredibly committed to do it. And, and, and so we're, we're just happy to, to, to have that privilege of, of working for the profession in that way. I don't know, Drew, if you want to share a little bit on sort of your perspective of what that was like. Yeah. It, it, you know, to be able to, to go into DC, spend three days there and meet with, I think it was 68 total members of Congress to have conversations about what the AANA is who CRNAs are and and what solutions we bring, what problems there are that exist and how we can help solve those problems. Um, it's, it's pretty impressive. And it's also very interesting when you interact with an individual who has clearly been sort of pre-briefed, right? They knew sort of the nuance of the issue. And I got to come in and do the fun part of sort of talk about what these things mean from a professional practice standpoint and that um, that kudos to the staff in DC because they're the ones that did all of that work to tee those things up so that those conversations become really, um, really smooth. Today's show is brought to you by the folks at CRNA Financial Planning, an independent consulting firm that offers financial planning services exclusively to CRNAs and their families. From planning for a child's future college expenses to building a predictable income stream in retirement, the firm is committed to offering you comprehensive financial services, customized to fit your unique needs and objectives. If you have questions about your financial future, get them answered. Call the team at 855-304-3748. That's 855-304-3748. Or go online to crnafinancialplanning.com. And if I can say something about the D.C. staff, what, we have eight people in our office, and that includes the receptionist. And our opposition has a shop with about 25 people in it. So what our D.C. office has been able to accomplish over all of these years is absolutely Herculean because it is clearly a David and Goliath clearly a David and Goliath. And so what they have accomplished for us is absolutely amazing. And they just, they keep one upping them, themselves every single year. Thank you, Sharon. You're, you're exactly right. We punch well above our weight class in that city. Um, you know, I our like pack is, <laughs> yes, our pack is routinely in the top 10 medical packs in the nation, and it is always the top nursing pack in the nation. We can't control how much other packs get. So, you know, there's other factors in this list. Um, this year, we moved up a spot. I believe we're number six currently, and we were seven last year. And, you know, the, it, it's really remarkable. But unfortunately, our opposition is the number one pack, and, and, and they just generate a lot more dollars. So, the more that we can contribute, the more access we will have. And that, you know, we were able to see that. It, it, it's not just, you know, I mean, the pack gets us in the door and I don't want to, you know, and we have a fantastic DC staff, but a, another big piece of it is all of the work that is done in Rosemont with our, our research team and our practice division to develop the information and the data that actually makes the legitimate bulletproof case for the positions that we're lobbying for. And, and so the whole organization works together. So you have a piece that is that has to be funded specifically by law through a PAC, but there is another piece that, that is a tremendous value add that is enabling it that is funded primarily through the member dues dollars. And those two things work in concert to make us that effective in DC. So, so yeah, we punch above our weight and, and I think that, that we will continue to do so. And if, if more people are involved, we will just have more outsized results based on the size of our team. And, and I think we all know that the, the battles you're fighting are getting more intense, not less intense right now. So let's, let's change subjects again here. Uh, Bill, I'm going to start with you because, uh, you know, we did a podcast out in Seattle 
talking about a rather new and unique initiative yeah. uh, called Room 8. I uh, just wanted to get an update on that and see how things are going. Yeah, absolutely. So I, I had the great privilege last year of announcing that that Room 8 was was a, a new thing that we had, we had brought into existence. And um, also some some of our initial moves with Room 8, um, at that point, it was, a, it was a brand new initiative that really had only been going for a few months, but we had, you know, we were able to make some some interesting early investments. And one, you know, just to recap, one was an, an investment in a strategic partner, MedGeo, which has created the underlying platform that Motion, our new job board, lives on. You know, anything we do that's new is it comes with a certain element of risk, and this was no exception. But this this is one where, where that has paid out. Motion has has proven to be a, a far superior product offering than our previous job board, um, both in terms of the user experience and how it works, and in terms of of the financial contribution that it it produces for the organization. And just you know, it, w- without getting into the specific dollars of it, I'll tell you that Motion exceeded the the income of the previous platform six months into its use so so on an annualized basis it's it's outpacing it significantly what we what we would typically have it have succeeded so in in the sense of we did all of this all of this new innovation stuff in in with the purpose of trying to identify new sources of revenue that were not tied to captive audiences like member dues so that we could distribute our revenue sources outside of 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 members specifically and motion is a great one because the the revenue from that does not come from members at all it comes it comes from employers of of crnas and and so it's it's an excellent tool for all of them similarly another non-captive audience thing that we 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 purchased we purchased the company block buddy and we rolled out block buddy and that one you know that's been an interesting one it it, it came with a there's been a number of questions about that as a as a platform about some of the messaging around it and you know just just to, to clarify some things it was a mature product when we bought it but you know, one thing that 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 we all learn when you go through um, a merger and acquisition, the acquisition part turns out to be the easy part of those of those two things. It's the the merger part that that presents you with the unforeseen challenges. And you know, Blackwood is a fantastic product, but it has a, a a set of tools and technologies that it's built on that are different than the tools and technologies that we have in place inside the organization. And so. You know, we have run into a couple of roadblocks and in, in, in some of the things that we wanted to do with it. We had a few things that we needed to get done to clean it up itself before we could begin some work on some things. So, you know, we've rolled out, we rolled out an update that was in the works when we made the acquisition back in the fall. And uh, just, just over in the last um, month or, and a half or so, we rolled out another update. And we're now beginning on building out new new features inside of BlockBuddy that are specifically aimed at providing new value to members of the AANA. And so we're, 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 we're going to be moving forward on those this year, and we're excited about those. We'll begin messaging about those. Actually, we, we began marketing this um, in the current form of it just, just last month, and so it's getting some new attention again. And even with all of that, um, it, it brings in, and this I'll, I'll share the number, it brings in a little over $20,000 a month in non-dues revenue, um, as is. And, and, and we know that when we add new features to it, it's it's just going to continue to to grow. You know, we've had a couple of other things that, that have come to fruition through the arrangements with organizations uh, where we have partnership, where we do joint marketing on on products and services, and 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 we share the benefits of that with them, and and that those things, those avenues are going well. As, um, in addition to the stuff that we've already done, but what I'm really excited to share, and and this was a press release a couple of weeks ago, is that at, at this year's Congress, we're going to be having our first ever pitch competition. Uh, it's we're going to it's the innovate. Pitch competition for M8. We're, we're sponsoring it through the um, AAMS, uh, our management services division, which is where we sell our insurance products. What this is going to be is um, it, it, it's going to be a Shark Tank style pitch competition live at Congress. And it, we hope it's going to be very exciting. It's exciting. It, we're seeing some submissions already for people who have, have put themselves forward uh, to compete in this competition. What's at stake for them is, you know, the, the five prizes are being handed out at the, the high end. In the first place is going to be a fifteen thousand contribution, fifteen thousand dollar contribution to the 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 first place winner, ten thousand for the second place, five thousand for the third, fourth and fifth will each get twenty five hundred dollars. 
what also comes along with it for the people who are for, for the winners is is access to the things that our innovation panel can do to sort of help them coach them and guide them as they develop their product a little bit further yeah it, right now this is front and center on our website so if you go to ana.com the, the the pitch competition is is the big banner when you get there you'll see it that's it, it, the best way to get to it but it's on the roommate lab.com website as well yeah and this is this is for anybody who is a CRNA, uh, you know, RRNA, SRNA, who is a leader or a member of a team that is developing a new product or service, has a new company related to the you know, CRNA or CRNA adjacent space. You know, the, the one thing that, that I, I throw out there is, you know, we, we, we don't really want people who are already getting mature investment and you know, people who have already raised more than $5 million. You know, they're, they're, they're a little bit beyond needing a pitch competition to get some lift for those that, that are really you know have an idea that they're really trying to get it off the ground and they want some help and some attention this, this is a great opportunity for them to get some visibility there and you know finally i think that the last point that i'd like to make and there's been a little bit of confusion about this and that you know we we launched room eight and we made some of these announcements last year right on the heels of approving our first dues increase in you know a decade or so and uh one one line of discussion that I hear um, not all the time, but with enough regular regularity that it's worth mentioning is that you know you're doing this with member dues dollars. Uh, well, organizationally that that's that's not true. Um, the all of the, the the support that goes into roommate is organized under our AAMS for-profit subsidiary, which is a profitable organization that has its own coffers that more than offset, all of the monies that have gone into supporting these endeavors and um, everything that we have done in this this effort is is very well vetted by our, our innovation panel by our cfo by me we have a whole tier of approval process to make sure that the things that get through are above board and, and are good fit for our organization and and so far you know i think you know knock on wood we, we've, we've we've done a really good job of finding the right kind of opportunities and you know, when I've been really impressed with with the creativity and innovation inside the, the just the CRNA population generally, and I'm looking forward to working with more of them. I think I think they will be better, and we will be better by continuing this. So it's going to be exciting. So, you know, when you're at Congress, man, you know, come by and, and watch the pitch competition. It'll, it should be fun. Next question: We can all come in and watch it. Yes. How cool is that? Well, who wants to talk to us about the new learning platform that the AANA is pushing out? Jeremy and I are getting a little bit of an intimate knowledge of it uh, recently since we're going to have some <laughs> stuff on it. So yeah, so, so previously, I think, I think most people listening will have had some exposure to our previous learning learning platform. Frankly, it was it, it was an interesting platform, but it really wasn't built to be a platform to support education. It was just more of a content platform. What we now have, what we launched um, on the 16th of last month of March was is our new education edge learning management system, which is a, a purpose-built platform to be an end-to-end -end learning management system for membership organizations. And it gives us a ton of ability to build out better learning experiences that are more tailored to how individuals might be using them over time. We'll see um, all of our stuff has migrated over. We were seeing people that are beginning to use it. We're, we're, we're not yet to the point to be able to report the early feedback that we're very optimistic. Um, the partner we've chosen with this is, is a proven partner in the space that that, that is a really excellent peer in, in, in the way that they develop their platform and the kind of the needs of what organizations like ours have in, in, in hosting and delivering content and learning experiences. It will come into play a little bit more down the road once we start rolling out our micro credentials, which um, you know is right now slated to be a, a fall timeline. We have we have some things in in the works in that direction. That professional development team is working very hard to to meet those deadlines, and we're, we're looking forward to that. But more it it, it and actually BlockBuddy together represent two new platforms on which we could provide educational content for our members. And I see those as foundational to us playing a larger role in providing a broader, more valuable portfolio of educational content for our members, um, which is something that, that I hope we continue to have new announcements in the years to come continually. Uh, I, you know, I think it, it, it's wonderful. I hope that 
hope the people who are are looking at it and have looked at it, hope you have taken a good look at it and have have liked what you see what you've seen. I know the project we're working on is going well, and, and I actually had a had a check in on that project today. Everybody's happy and excited to see that coming along. Well, as we kind of wrap it up this evening, and Drew, is there anything you'd like to add here? I would just, uh, yeah, thanks, Sharon. I'd, I'd love to thank the members for the opportunity to serve in this capacity. I'm about halfway through my year as as president of the board of directors, and it's been a it's been a privilege and an honor. It is it's the coolest it, thing you have ever done. It it's. It, what I've what I've found what I've told people is um, it, it the opportunity to represent to represent CRNAs in places that I would never as an individual have been had had an opportunity to be because no one would want Drew Riddle there they they want the president of the AANA board of directors and and this year that happens to be me um, and and other presidents Sharon like yourself and others that I've talked to um, say have have shared that. Uh, similarly. The other piece I would say is we are an ever-changing profession, meaning the anesthesia that I provided today was very different than the anesthesia I provided five years ago and 10 years ago and certainly 20 years ago. And our professional association also is in the process of really great change to keep up with the demands of the new member of the AANA while respecting and understanding the needs and the members that have come before us and our legacy members that that remain with us now. And it is an interesting time, a little bit tumultuous, as we all know, um, balancing all of those things. But if we think of the evolution of the profession of anesthesiology, that is what your board of directors is looking at Every time we meet, what is the evolution of the American Association of Nurse Anesthesiology and how that needs to parallel the advances and, um, and incredible leaps and bounds that are growing in the healthcare space in, in nurse anesthesiology. And so I hope that that, um, while it may be uncomfortable for some, it's certainly uncomfortable for me at times when I'm sitting and thinking about these things. I hope it's exciting to everyone else as it is to me, because I plan on still being a CRNA for a really long time and a member of this AANA uh, for a really long time. And I hope um, what the board has done this year has done a little bit to help advance that. And I know boards before us and, and after as well as well. So thanks for giving me that opportunity. Bill, would you like to add anything to that? Oh, I think just, you got I... you pretty well worn in by now, right? <laughs> uh, it's like a rented scooter some days, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I, I, I joke. I, I love what I do. I get to work with some of the most committed people in their profession at the top of their profession. And I can't tell you how rewarding it is to see people in, in that position in their careers regularly. The amount of passion and commitment that, that the board and all of our volunteers and all of our committees have for this organization and what they do and what our members do is incredible. And um, not just me, but um, you can ask any any of our staff you know, what, what they like about this organization. And it is the energy that CRNAs bring to their profession every day. Just to brag a little bit, we, we just this past year um, were named one of Chicago's best workplaces for the second time in our history. And this time, we not only were we did we we get on the list, but we were the we were the, we were the highest association on the list, and we beat out the other associations on the list by many many numbers of ranks, um, including one of my former employers, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. They were way down on the list compared to us, and part of that process included a, tr a lot of um, surveying of staff. It was all voluntary to them, and and and. And some of it included some long form feedback. And we were able to get some word clouds out of that, those results. And one of the things that was the most prominent point that our staff made that they enjoyed was the value to the profession and CRNAs and advocacy were all right there. As like the, they, they really do enjoy the work they do for our, for our members. And so, so yeah, I, I get to work with the top CRNAs in the business at the peak of their career when they're most passionate and have the time to get it. And with a team of incredible professionals at the office that really does thrive on also being able to work with it. it it's just incredible. Um, I, I feel it's a great privilege to, to be, we're here working with y'all. 
Yeah, well, I think both of you said that very well. Um, Drew, you hit the nail on the head. There is nothing constant anymore except for change. Um, and the CRNA industry is undergoing a lot of change, not only from a clinical standpoint, but also a recruiting standpoint, a workforce development, politically. Uh, there's a lot of change going on. And uh, you guys are navigating that. And from my perspective, seem to be doing a great job. You know, I, I know all our members might not know both of you guys, but I will tell you, I know both of you. And you are being represented at CRNAs extremely well by both of these guys. So thank you for what both of you are doing for the CRNA community um, and sharing what you've done for the CRNA community. Um, and guys, I think it's a wrap. I think so. Hi, this is Jackie Rolls, President of the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists and President and Founder of Our Hearts, Your Hands, a global anesthesia support community that takes donations to allow nurse anesthetists in low and middle income countries to go to educational programs, buy equipment or textbooks. Your donations are tax deductible and we would appreciate your support. Be sure to subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and anywhere you like to listen to shows. Also, be sure to check out beyondthemaskpodcast.com. Each episode is posted there with a corresponding blog post, and we timestamp important parts of the episode to help you quickly get to the content you're looking for. Also, check out the special series section on the site. You can follow along and catch up on the CRNA History Series, episodes specifically about political conversations in the industry, or try the CRNA Personal Finance Series. It's all on beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And if you have a question for the show or want to be a guest or even suggest a particular topic, fill out the contact form on the site or send an email directly to us at info at beyondthemaskpodcast.com. And lastly, let's take the conversation social. Check out our Beyond the Mask podcast Facebook page and Facebook group.